Okay. All right, recording has begun. So I'm gonna go into presentation mode and we will begin. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, folks, if, if past meetings are any indication of today, we're gonna have people coming in for about the next five minutes. So Rachel's gonna be letting folks in. We have a full day, so I'm just gonna glance over a lot of these introductory slides. Um, all the introductory slides are on all presentations that are recorded. So the presentations and uh, the recordings are available. I'll show you that link in a bit. So um, if anyone wants more detail on these intro slides, feel free to access those. But we have two big presentations from Darren LeBrake and, and John Jackson today. So I wanna give plenty of time for those. Um, this is our fourth meeting. We're starting these started these back in August. Um, so uh, this is just time for folks to check in and talk about anything that's going on with the, their Enviro DIY monitoring. Uh, we're supporting a Delaware River watershed initiative, but more broadly outside of that across the Delaware Basin. Um, and this is all funded through the Delaware River watershed initiative. You can look at that website, <clears throat> four states, one source to get more info on the DRWI. Um, so general format here, it's time and space to check in. We're doing uh, two types of presentations, generally the station owner manager presentations, which is Darren today. And, um, and we're doing focused topic presentations, which is John's presentation today on conductivity. Um, we'll also do Stroud updates right. regularly. So this meeting is every third Thursday of the month, 2.30 to 3.30, the Zoom link is always the same. Um, and the, the group that receives the emails is a pretty large group, but everyone, please feel free to pass that information on to others who are, um, you know, who you're working with or who you think would like to attend. Um, okay. So here's our facilitators, me, Rachel, Krista, and Shannon are all Stroud folks. Carol and George are uh, working directly with us at Stroud. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, they are both uh, master watershed stewards with the Chester and Delaware County groups. Um, we are recording the presentation. We won't record the question section if we end up having one of those. Um, everyone, please just keep your speakers muted unless you're talking. Um, like I mentioned before, these uh, recordings and the presentation um, the presentations themselves are all available at this website along with a lot of other materials. This is our general format. We're having a new uh, section today, just kind of testing out slight variations in the format. We're having photos of the month, just, just kind of a time for some whimsy and just kind of sharing photos of uh, recent activities, not necessarily directly related to Enviro DIY, but touching on that. Um, so for this topic, uh, photos of the month, we have this share link and I've made a folder in there where folks can share their photos. So feel free to use that if, um, if you'd like to share photos in next month's meeting. meeting. Um, so here's our agenda for today. Um, as I mentioned, Darren's gonna talk about uh, his work in the Cobbs Creek watershed, monitoring an impervious and piped watershed for potential daylighting and neighborhood wide green BMPs. And then John's gonna, <clears throat> John Jackson with the Stroud Center is gonna talk about uh, conductivity and streams. It's a two part presentation. Part one is uh, today, next part's gonna be in December. And then we'll have, hopefully have a little bit of time at least for uh, questions for those guys as well as any other issues that come up. Um, primary goal again, uh, from Stroud perspective is just to support station owners and using the stations for their own purposes but we are beginning um, to do basin-wide data analysis internally and to develop other watershed characterization tools. So uh, just a few Stroud Center updates. Keep an eye on your sensors, especially right now in terms of leaves as well as battery levels. Um, this is just an example of the need, you know, just daily checking monitor to make sure that the that your station is functional and reporting data to the data portal. Visiting the station weekly is really ideal. 
um, and then doing your QC checks to make sure that the data are reading correctly, especially if you see anomalies in the data, it's good to get out and do uh, cross checks with a calibrated handheld meter. Um, so this new little uh, uh, charger and volt reader is a nice uh, piece of equipment that Shannon has been developing. Uh, it doesn't come uh, for use, it, it, you can't use it straight from the uh, manufacturer, Shannon has to modify it, but these are available. So if anyone is interested in getting one of these to charge your batteries, to swap in and out of your station, feel free to be in touch. Shannon is also gonna be writing a blog um, that folks can follow to modify these on their own. But that, will, that probably will be available, that blog in the next month or so. Um, we also have this new um, full monitoring kit available on the Enviro DIY shop now. This is essentially the, the main kit that you need to build the stations that most folks are currently working with. All you need in, in addition to this is the actual sensor and then the hardware to install the station at the site, the, the logger pole on the, the, um, the uh, rebar on which the sensors are mounted. Um, <clears throat> and then Jim Moore, this is especially for you, but anyone else like Robert Sarnoski who has built their own stations um, uh, that are different than this kind of standard one that we're working with. Um, Jim was asking about how to upgrade his stations to 4G. And here's the, here's the list of things to do, Jim. So, and Rob, if you would be interested in doing that with your temperature loggers and anyone else is, who, who's doing DIY on their own, this is just the equipment that you're gonna need to upgrade your Mayfly board to transmit via 4G. So, any questions before we move on to Darren's presentation? Um. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. I assume that's online, or do we need to go to the video to get um, those? I can I can email that list to you, Jim, um, after we're done here. But this this presentation itself will be posted probably by tomorrow or Monday as well on the on the Wiki Watershed slash DRWI page. Okay, so the link then would be available. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But I'll email it to you after the presentation too. Um, so here we are, and I will stop share and let Darren take over at this point. And uh, Darren, do you want to introduce yourself quick too? I didn't. I don't think I really introduced you very much. Hi. Well, <laughs> um, I'm I'm Darren LeBrake. I'm an ecologist. I've been working in this field for many years, I um, volunteer my time to the Darby Creek Valley Association. I've been on the board there for, I don't know, 15, 18 years, long time. And I became interested in um, a particular watershed and have really focused a lot of time and energy and effort into it and understanding it in hopes of being able to, uh, at some point, make it a little bit more pleasant than it is today. So that's the one that I'm gonna spend some time talking about here. So it's um, a watershed that's been monitored since November of 2017 with SL-137, unnamed trip to uh, Cobbs Creek. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of depth about the uh, watershed, like how in the world did this watershed end up where it is today? Oop, hang on, I guess I gotta, there we go. So what did the landscape look like in the 1880s and then through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s? This is um, in Haverford Township, right at the corner of where Haverford Township meets Lower Marion Township meets the city of Philadelphia meets uh, Upper Darby Township. So it's right in that interesting corner there. And these are uh, what some nearby tributaries look like. If anybody's heard of Naylor's Run, these are tributaries. I think the one on the left-hand side with the concrete walls is actually the main stem or the main named part of Naylor's Run. And the one on the right is a uh, unnamed trib to it. This is uh, just immediately upstream from that last photograph with those uh, rock baskets. That is actually a bridge abutment in the foreground. 
and there used to be a stream that went through that yard. So the way the um, urbanization has happened in this, what I'll call a first tier suburb outside of Philadelphia is that there was no respect for the streams. They were in the way. So we put them inside pipes and covered them up with grass and we barbecue over top of them now. Put a red dot, this little red dot is on, I think it's on every slide with a figure or map on it so that we're aware of where our place is. But you can see we're right in that very eastern, far eastern corner of Delaware County, right up against Montgomery County and uh, the city of Philadelphia. There's the dot again, Haverford Township is up to the north. That's the watershed that drains down to where that little dot is. And that little dot is where the um, DIY meter is. So here's an 1887 map of Haverford Township. You can see it's mostly large farms. There's a few patches of forest, roads just along the edges of the farms. And there's a lot of streams in there. You can zoom in on it. You'd see all the streams that are in there. Um, this is the watershed that I have been focusing on for a few years now. In 1887, there were nine large landowners. There was one little patch of forest down here in the bottom, two streams going through and these springs that fed into it. They're identified right on the map as a spring. Um, and then the impervious is just a few roads crossing these large tracts of land. And there's our little telltale red dot. That's where the Enviro DLI meter is. Here's what the road system looks like today over this watershed. <clears throat> and as you can see, none of the roads um, miss or go around or really are next to any of these streams that were there in 1887. This is what the impervious looks like now in this watershed. The watershed has more than 1700 houses. All the streams are gone from the landscape. You can see faded blue lines under here. These are the original streams. And you can tell that we just bulldozed, piped, and built houses right on top of everything. And there's our little red dot again. So here's, here's an interesting shot from 1950 of that watershed. And this big triangular piece in the middle was a golf course. And the light blue lines are those original 1887 streams. This is a stream that's visible in the 1950 aerial photograph. So I gave it a slightly different blue color. And then here's our existing stream as we have it today. Three years later, the golf course is gone and it's completely covered with houses. This little tributary for some reason remained behind or in between these two rows of houses and coming down through this little tiny patch of forested remnant here. This little open triangle over here later on turns into a elementary school. So you can see heavy duty urbanization of this watershed. And over here at the uh, far eastern edge is Cobbs Creek coming down through here. So this is a tributary that goes right into Cobbs Creek. Here's what it looks like now in 1958. The stream is gone. The uh, yellow lines represent the pipes that carry these two tributaries. They continue to flow today. And I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. Um, so this is a 520 acre watershed. Because it's under a square mile, it's not studied or um, mapped by FEMA for flooding. And there's lots of flooding that happens. Um, all the streams are gone. I'm sure that all those springs are being discharged by someone's sump pump unless they buried it under five feet of fill or 10 feet of fill and then build a house over top of it. So the only remaining reach of the stream is behind a uh, little repair shop and out onto this golf course. And that red dots off by a little bit. It's actually right at the edge of this watershed boundary that I mapped. Um, you can see all those little green boxes are the inlets that collect all the storm water from this watershed and immediately send it right into those pipes. Um, the oval is where there is repeat flooding. The folks that live in that neighborhood have lost about 20 plus cars over the years. There's a house that was raised about two years ago because it was a repeat flooder, even though it was built in 1920s. Um, there's another one that's proposed and there are 15 to 20 houses that, get, that have been flooded multiple times because the stormwater no longer fits inside of the pipes. 
Here is the stream when it first gets to see the light of day. On the left-hand side, those two pipes are 54-inch diameter pipes, and they flow, and it's a perennial stream. So there is water coming out of those pipes 365 days a year, but you can't see any water because it's all in underground piping up through the watershed. And the two on the right, are bringing a lot of, there's a major intersection right where um, these pipes get, or where the stream gets to see the sunlight again. And so those two pipes on the right-hand side are draining the flood water out of that intersection. Um, this is what the 1953 development looked like. Sorry, it's a little grainy, but I had to zoom in on there. And then here's what it looks like today. And you can sort of understand why the water doesn't fit inside the pipes anymore. When you look at all those little red boxes are the original houses and just about every single one of these houses has some sort of an addition on the back side, on the front side. And I know from walking through this neighborhood, this is very close to where I live, which is probably why I got became so interested in it. Um, all of them, everybody has far more cars than they did in the 1950s. So everybody paved additional area behind their house so that they could park their two or three cars and maybe not park all of them on the street. So here's what the watershed looks like without all that other noise in it. And here's what the mapped impervious looks like. And I'm just taking a look at that. That looks like that's around 50 plus percent impervious. And one of the downsides to having so many houses is that you have to have an equal number of roads so that everyone can get to and from their house. So this whole area is just saturated with roads and houses. I do, I do part of this talk here to um, groups around here, rotary clubs and other places to try and get people to understand what their impact is on the streams. This is, these are the two typical lots there and you can see the impervious in there. And as soon as you add the two houses with their additions on them, you're already at 20% impervious. And then since everybody gets to own that piece of the road to get back and forth to their house, so it's really each one of these houses because they were built and need a road to get there, they're at 34% impervious. And when you add in the rest of the paving, the, the um, driveways and everything else to this year at 56% impervious and 100% of the water that lands on those surfaces, as I'm sure you all understand, immediately runs off, it put into a pipe and goes straight into the streams. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the little tributary that's on that golf course. And I grabbed one storm. This was probably um, 2018 or 2019. I grabbed this one storm because I thought it was pretty spectacular. So it's 6.45 PM. I had base flow and it started to rain. And then by seven o'clock, the water level in this little creek had gone up 40 inches. So in 15 minutes, it went up 40 inches. And then 15 minutes later, it went back down. It was still about seven inches of water flowing in there, but it went back down. So this is by definition a flashy stream. Um, here's base flow at the top, looking upstream and downstream for a little bridge. The meter is right where my mouse is moving. So it's sitting right about here. Well, actually it's in the water. The uh, post is out here, but it sits right in the water there. And this was not a particularly large storm. This was probably a quarter to a half an inch of rain that fell in a you know, late fall or early winter storm event, or it might've been a spring one. So I um, used part of the grant that we received to install the meter. I held on to it until I had, could finally pick the right kind of camera because I wanted to be able to film what happens in here because it's easy for me to see and understand what's happening by looking at graphs, but the, the population that I'm trying to reach does not understand that as easily as I do. So I said, I think I need visual aids for these folks. So I installed this camera in June, 2020, and I grabbed this clip just earlier today so that you can have an idea. This is what base flow looks like in the stream. It's a nice little stream flowing through there. And then, Oops, 
I don't know why it does it a second time. So here, here was a uh, July 6th storm and sorry, it's tilted. I didn't know that when I mounted it to the golf cart, golf cart bridge that every time a golf cart went by, it vibrated it enough and it tipped it. So I have to go over periodically and adjust it to uh, where it needs to be. And I'll probably pull this one back and forth a little bit just so you can, because otherwise I, I do not know how to make it go fast or slow motion. So this is the storm event. Sorry, there's no sound. I didn't figure out how to record the sound until, a, until August. But all those little white dots going by are um, raindrops coming down. This is a heavy downpour that happened on July 6th. And you can see it you know, out here on the water, all the little drops bouncing through the water. Now, if I pull it ahead, storm continues for a little while, then it's letting up. And then let me see if I get this to the right spot. Um, right about here, the storm has subsided and not much of a change in the stream. And now I'm gonna pull it to here. See if I got the right spot. Yeah, so the rain is pretty much stopped and sorry about that quick jump, but I, the, I'm i still evaluating whether I wanna use this program to record clips. But what you can see happened there was the rain stopped and then, you know, there, there, so that's the end of the storm. The rain stopped. You can see how crystal clear and mirror like that pool of water is down there. And this is the rush of water that comes off of all of the streets, has gone into the pipes and is delivered to this stream. And it's pretty impressive. You can actually see the wave of storm water going through this stream channel. And as I pull it forward, I'm going to do this a little bit faster. You can see the channel is just filling up. That's about a minute after the water started arriving and it just continues. You can see the change. I can see the change in the color of the water. It's now all cloudy with the sediment that's coming in. And it just keeps coming. It pixelates from time to time, but you can see this storm filled up that whole channel to that point in three minutes. So in three minutes, if you're standing in there, the water's probably come up close to a foot. This is a storm just a few days later on July 10th. And it was a lot more rain. And you can see that it's completely outside of its banks. It looks like a whitewater stream. There's large debris flying down through the channel. And I thought that I had captured the biggest storm. Then we had East Eas visit us on August 4th. And here's what East Eas, and this one actually has the sound. So I'm gonna talk over it just a little bit as it finishes the video. This watershed, because there is a rain gauge here, we got 8.31 inches and the storm from start to finish was seven hours. But most of that rain fell in three short bursts. And those bursts, according to the rain gauge, the rate that the water was coming down was at about four inches an hour. So this was just a ridiculous amount of water. Um, I also do um, a lot of volunteer work with the Southwest Philly community of uh, Eastwick. And they told me that this storm that happened on August 4th, East East, the remnants of East East, was the same size storm and the same amount of flooding that they had in there when Tropical Storm Floyd came in 1999. They said it hit the same watermarks in their houses, it flooded just as many people out. So now we've had two very substantial storms in a uh, pretty short window of time. Hey, Darren, can I interrupt for one moment? You've got about five, yes. five minutes or so, if that sounds okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good then. So this, just, just for a quick refresher, this is what this stream looks like at base flow. I felt like I had to put this back in there because all you saw was that monsterish rush of water. 
but you so you just picture that entire field in front of you full of uh, rushing crazy water. So here's details on the camera. After doing a couple of years of poking around time and again, looking for the right kind of mirror camera, this one is made by Arlo. You get the camera, a power adapter, a rechargeable battery, and a mount for it. And then what? Here's here's what they cost. I bought mine through Verizon because that's the people I have my cell service with. It's four hundred twenty three ninety nine delivered to my house. Camera. Um, I bought a second battery because I can charge it here and then take it down and swap it out when I need to instead of waiting until. You know, oh no, there's a storm. I got to go get the battery, bring it back and charge it. So 40 bucks for the battery. I got a brown protective skin for the outside of it because I didn't want it to be terribly visible. The face on it, as you can see, is black. And then the, the shell on the outside is white. And it just made it too visible for the urban environment where I put it. And then to get a charger for the battery is another 20 bucks. So all in, you're at $562 and you can get video captures like that. I'm using a free piece of software that I will probably buy because I do like the quality. And you just log in through the Arlo website, log into your camera, start the recording, start the real-time camera shot, and it just records it for you. And it's only like $5.28 a month to my cell bill. Here, here I'm going to just bounce through these last three slides really quickly here. So there's the potential for like a thousand or more rain gardens in this watershed. There's only three large pieces of land left. Underground storage and detention opportunities only exist in those large ones because everything else is an individual homeowner's small lot. This is the area that floods all the time. They're not eligible for the flood insurance because the size of the watershed isn't greater than a square mile or 640 acres. So we have a growing greener grant. We're installing temperature buttons so that I know when the water arrives in the pipe. We have hobos so that I can measure the volume of water that's coming through there. We've created a mathematical mo model that predicts the stormwater through here. We're gonna start calibrating that model. And then hopefully inside of one of those two yellow dots, we're gonna install 50 rain gardens because that's what we got a grant for if I can get all of the homeowners inside of the very top edge of the watershed to agree to install or have us come and install a free rain garden because there really isn't any other way to manage the water. And then this affords us the opportunity to measure how much later does the water show up in the pipe, how much less water shows up in the pipe. And if we do this on 1500 or a thousand or more yards in the watershed, can we make a measurable difference in the outfall down there at the pipe? So that's it. I went through it as fast as I could. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. I hope I didn't go over too much. You're Dave, muted, you're Dave. Dave. Can't hear oh, you. There we go. Sorry, I clicked on mute and it didn't take. Um, thanks, Darren. That was that was uh, perfect timing. Really nice presentation. Um, I think we're gonna take. We're going to take um, questions at the end after John finishes his. So um, right now we have John Jackson. He's going to talk about conductivity and streams. This is part one. He's going to do the second part in the December meeting. So uh, I think he has a lot of introductory materials and some specifics, but he'll probably get into even more specifics in December. So make sure to tune in for the second part. And um, I will stop share and allow John to share his screen and take it away. Okay, should work. Got it? Yep, you're good. All right, so what I'm going to do today is some basic water chemistry believe it or not. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this is I, I'm finding that a lot of people talk about the things they measure without context. In other words, they have an instrument, but no background. 
And, and in some cases I'm finding, and this is true, whether it's temperature or conductivity or even a, a flow event, I could show you pictures of White Clay Creek and the same storm that Darren saw or one that we had two days later, um, three days later that uh, in a, a, a watershed that has almost no impervious cover was probably the biggest flow we've seen in 10 years or more. Um, so it, it's context, context, context when it comes to extreme events. And in the case of what we'll talk about today, common events. So we're gonna talk about conductivity, electrical conductivity, definitions, what's it, it about? In other words, conductivity is about salts. It's about ions, cations, uh, anions. And the salts are all, it's about solubility. And some salts dissolve more easily than others. The more salts that dissolve, the greater your conductivity. And finally, there's a lot of natural variation, geographically and temporally in conductivity. And before you talk about human effects, you need to understand what is occurring on the landscape in, in uh, landscapes such as ours. Mine's gonna be very Pennsylvania centric. But um, as you'll see, I'm using some US maps. It's not hard to see how wherever you're at, there's a fair bit of variation and you need to keep that in mind. So another thing is, is all the terms we use to refer to salt. These are scientific measurements. I can get a measurement for salinity, TDS, total dissolved solids, electrical conductivity or specific conductance, as well as I can do grab samples or some sort of a litmus test and, and measure uh, various kinds of salts, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, as well as just say, uh, plain old chloride. You can also titrate it out and come up with carbonate. Uh, believe it or not, alkalinity or carbonate is, is one of your anions that, that come out of the dissolution of salt. So what is conductivity, electrical conductance, specific conductance? ECE, as I call it, is, is, it measures how easily electricity flows through a substance. In our case, we're interested in water. But you can look at conductivity through steel, through copper, through glass, through wood. Um, when conductance is high, there's little resistance. Salt is just a compound that when you put it into a solution, in this case, water, it separates into cations and anions. When a salt is as a salt, it's electrically neutral. It doesn't have a charge. However, when it, the anions and cations disassociate, you have um, positive and negatively charged an, uh, particles. So table salt is sodium chloride and it separates to sodium and chloride. Limestone is primarily calcium carbonate and it separates to calcium and then carbonate. Dolomite is magnesium limestone. It separates out to your calcium, your magnesium and your carbonates. Those of you who pay attention to hardness, water hardness, say in your house, there at the bottom line is why. Hardness is calcium and magnesium. The amount of calcium and magnesium you have, the more you have, the harder your water. So the salt is, is composed of these ions. And, and an ion is just the electrical charged atom or group of atoms. And it's formed by the loss or addition of electrons. That's why it has a charge. In other words, it's a positive or a negative. When they're positively charged, they're called cations. And that's your sodium your potassium, your magnesium, your calcium. We're finding when we're dealing with salt toxicity, these cations are all about the story. The story is all about the cations. The anions are what we started out talking about over the last decade or more. And those are the negatively charged particles, the chloride, sulfate, carbonates. We initially thought because I think people use thought of salt as a disinfectant and that was the chlorine or the chloride, that was the disinfectant. We thought that that was the toxic element, but the, the data are showing that it's probably more tied to your cation than it is to the anion. 
And this is what it looks like in practice. So you have your salt particle in and amongst your H2Os, your water. So here's your chloride, here's your sodium attached. That's the same as calling it a crystal. And when it disassociates, you see, for example, this chloride is surrounded by four water molecules. This sodium is surrounded by four water molecules. It's this disassociation that affects the conductivity of water. Not all molecules dissolve, uh, but I mean disassociate when they dissolve. And sugar, methanol, ethanol, those are all good examples of you can dissolve a lot of sugar in, in water, but it doesn't disassociate. Here's another way of looking at it. If you've ever looked at a salt crystal, you realize it's a cube where you have your positive sodium in here with your negative chloride. When it disassociates, your chloride's here, your sodium's here, and you're surrounded by these water H2O particles. And you'll notice the negative tied to the positive, the positive associated with the negatives. Well, when we apply a charge to it, we get movement of those charged particles so that your negatively charged particles go toward the positive end and your positively charged particles go to the negative end. So your anode and your cathode. And this is, I threw this in as an experiment. If you're seeking to teach people about how this works, you can set it up. Here's your battery, here's your light bulb, here's your distilled water. Distilled water won't conduct electricity or will conduct very, very little. Your light bulb stays off. You can throw in any kind of, uh, of a, a salt that does, before it dissolves, for example, if it was just rock salt, you would still have no light on because the anions and cations haven't separated yet. However, as those chlorides and sodium separate, you start getting electrical conductance between your two probes. Electricity flows, you complete the circuit, light bulb on. So if you want to show people what it means in terms of electrical conductivity, this is an easy experiment and you can reset it and do it again and do it again. This shows nicely just the relationship. So specific conductance is plotted down here. Total dissolved solids or salt is here. As you increase the salt, you increase your conductivity. The funny thing about this graph is this is the exact opposite of the way I would plot it. Because I tend to put what causes it at the bottom and the response is at the top. And the salt is the cause. But because of the way we're using this, we're using conductivity to predict salts. That's why it's, it's here. So it's not that conductivity causes salts. The salts are causing conductivity. More salts, more conductivity. I threw this one in to show you the range. So distilled water, nearly nothing. Rainfall, very, very low conductivity. There's almost nothing dissolved in rainfall. And, and it's more often than not on the low end of the scale. By the time you're looking at tap water, drinking water, potable water, fresh water in streams, you're looking at, at 50, 50 to 1500. This is the range that's what happens when you get soil contact. This would be wastewater. Here's ocean water down at 55,000. And what we'll talk about next time is human impacts to some of these things. And one of the things I'll reference is this, seawater. And just so you know, if you were to look at produced water from a fracking well, it could be well over 100,000. All this is about solubility. And I threw this graph, this table in to show you the different solubilities. So the higher you up or are up on this, the more easily it is to dissolve you into water. So here's our sodium chloride where we could put 36 grams of, of uh, table salt easily dissolved into 100 grams of water. Or another way of looking at it, and, and you think about it, this is 360 grams can be dissolved into one liter of water. 
I threw in three things to reference you just thinking back. At the bottom here, calcium carbonate, limestone. You can dissolve almost no limestone into, into um, water. You'll notice instead of at 30 or 50 or 100, we're at six one hundredths of a gram. It's very insoluble. The other two I threw up here are two common non sodium chloride de icing products calcium chloride, magnesium chloride. They're even more soluble than table salt. So you don't build a building out of any of these guys at the top of the list. The only thing we're building out of, uh, out of these salts, a limestone building, is down here. And that's because limestone's relatively soft, uh, uh, insoluble. It's not marble. It's not granite. But it's better than any of those other salts. This chart shows solubility in, the, uh, in reverse direction. And this is about crystallization. So if you were to take a jar of salt water and dry it out, you won't get any precipitation until you've removed 68%. Once you do that, carbonate comes out. Then you need to take out another 20% to get your gypsum out. And then in the next 10% is when your table salt starts precipitating out. That's what's happening in these natural salt ponds that, that people are, are, are uh, grabbing sea salt, for example, is they're precipitating these things out. You can do that at home. Another demonstration if you wanted to. If you had seawater, you can put it in a watch glass and let it evaporate. And the outer rings are gonna be your calcium carbonate, then your gypsum, then your sodium chloride, and then your potassium and magnesium chloride. And they form these rings. You can see them quite clearly. The whole key to this, since we're measuring conductivity, is remember this relationship. Conductivity goes up, the amount of salt goes up. But this was specific conductance. And when we say specific conductance, we're talking about specific conduct conductivity at 25 degrees. And it's 25 because conductivity changes with temperature. So this is a plot of temperature versus conductivity, where at 25, we're looking at anywhere from 1200 to um, 1500 microsiemens per centimeter. This is important to keep in mind because quite often your meters will have specific conductance and electrical conductivity. You need to only pay attention to specific conductivity because it is compensating for this temperature effect. Because remember, this 1500 at 25 is down here below 1100 at 10 degrees. So your winter temperatures and your summer temperatures for the same water are gonna vary greatly. So it's very important to pay attention on your meter that you're recording specific conductivity. In other words, conductivity corrected for temperature. So what's going on when we measure these natural sources of conductivity? It's all about geology, underlying geology and, and precipitation. So soft water means that we have limited concentration of calcium and magnesium. Hard water, we have significant, amount, significant amounts of magnesium and calcium. And it's about rain. And whether you realize it or not, all rain is acidic because it's dissolved CO2 into it, and it, it reduces the pH down to about 5.3 naturally. That contributes to the weathering of your bedrocks, whether it's granite or limestone or sa sand or, or um, sandstones. And that weathering process is where we get the dis dissolution of salts into the anion and cation phases. I threw this picture in to show you how limestone goes, where limestone is so easily eroded relative to say granite, and you get these underground pathways, but you also end up with very hard water versus soft water coming off of granite. This is a map of limestone or soluble bedrocks across the United States. That's the blue here. And then they show two other things. One is humid areas or areas with a lot of rainfall greater than 30 inches. And that's this gray area. 
And then areas that get less than 30 inches, this would be the more arid portions of the United States shown in, in yellow over here. Your underlying geology with precipitation contributes to your conductivity. Where you have limestone or soluble bedrocks, you get elevated conductivities because you're dissolving those bedrocks. This is a, a blow up in the Pennsylvania to show the slivers of limestone where you're gonna have your most soluble um, bedrocks. This is out of Chester County. This is data from 450 wells that they've monitored for a 10 year period. I've just highlighted just the range. In one county, Pennsylvania, this is where the Stroud Center is, where they have a minimum and a maximum, minimum being 23 and a maximum of 1400. That's a significant amount of variation. And some of this might be pollution related, road salt related, but it dates back to 2001. It's very different than 2020. Um, but I just wanted to show you the range that you can see. The other thing is if you just think about medians and your underground or your, your underlying bedrock, we have a range, if you're in the limestone area, of over 600, whereas in a quartzite area, you're about 150. Fourfold difference occurring naturally. The upper quartile, the upper quarter of all measurements across the county, we're averaging 350. This map plots those numbers as black dots above that upper quartile. This gray band here, these gray bands down here show you wells that cross that line on average consistently. So there is some distribution, but you also Hi. notice there's a fair bit of sites that are outside of that distribution. So that's bedrock translating into conductivity. Here's a map of the United States showing conductivity, specific conductance. The range is 1700 to 10. Remember what I just showed you for Chester County. One more slide, 2300 or 23 to 1400. Literally in the county, we have as much variation as you have in the United States, but you don't see it that easily in this map you lose a lot of the small scale heterogeneity. For example, limestone stream, Valley Creek, Valley Forge PA, very, very limey stream. Conductivity is often over 800. It would put it in the red category. You'll notice there's, the, in this le level of resolution, you can't see it. But you do see some of that patterning that was showing up in that li limestone map. John, so, you've got- yeah. John, you've got a couple minutes. Hope okay. That, okay. We're, this gives you some range, this regional variation, three streams ranging from 128 or 29 to 152. These we're seeing commonly on the low end, less than 100 buckwa, on a high end, greater than 800, all within a three or four county area in southeastern PA. These differences are natural they may be ecologically important. We see natural limestone streams being having the popper faunas and physiologically low ionic strength water also challenging. Next we're gonna, and the last thing we're gonna deal with is temporal variability and that has to do with rainfall versus base flow. Rain events, just like Darren described, quite often result in overland flow. And overland flow means short resi residence time, little contact to soils that has low conductivity versus water that rainfall that goes underground and then ends up in the stream or river, longer residence time, more contact with soil and rocks, higher conductivity. This graph shows you a blue line, which is the flow or water depth. The yellow line here is conductivity. This is a dilution effect. This is a dilution effect related to rain events. Water goes up, conductivity goes down. 
This is very natural. We see it in all streams. We see it happens frequently. Some cases it's a small change, in other cases it's a large change. These are all dilution events tied to precipitation, tied to the idea that rainfall doesn't have much salt, most of our flow during these storm events is overland flow that doesn't pick up salts and therefore it doesn't spike. It does a dilution. These differences are natural. There's no known ecological relationship. Nobody studied these and said, oh, these are harmful or not. And one of the reasons it's safe to assume that they're not harmful is they're very, very short lived. The one thing you do notice though is, is there can be parallel patterns within a region, especially with larger regional storm events. These are three different sites, all responding in parallel over time. Here, the blue line is the storm event. So all of them saw the same storm in August of this year that resulted in this dilution and drop. And then, but you notice how quickly, 12 hours, 24 hours, conductivities back up to background. So the things to remember, electrical conductivity, specific conductance, it's about salt, but it doesn't tell you anything about the specifics of the salt. It doesn't tell you calcium carbonate versus sodium chloride versus potassium chloride. There's a lot of natural variation. Precipitation can move it around 100 to 200 microsiemens per centimeter, depending on the event but geology can make it vary from 500 to 1,000 microsiemens per centimeter within the same region. The natural spatial variation is probably more important than the natural temporal variation. Why? Because it's there all the time. Whereas these flashy events, they go away. That's it. Awesome, John, thank you. That was a informative presentation as usual. Um, I'm going to, yeah, good, thanks, John. Uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and there we go. Okay, um, so actually let's go back. Haircut. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, yeah, Jim, mute, thank you. Um, all right, so questions for John at this point, or Darren. Let's go into questions for John and Darren. Oh, okay, I have, I have a question I should know the answer to as an electrical engineer, but uh, John, uh, micro modes and micro Siemens use them both. Uh, aren't they the same? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I forget the exactly how they you go back and forth, but they're basically the same. Yeah. Mo is okay. the was the one that was historically used, but they transitioned to micro Siemens, I believe, later. Right. It's uh, reciprocal ohms. Anyway, yes. the other more interesting question: I've been running some experiments or looking for at road salt, and I ran a test this summer, and what washed off the Pennsylvania Turnpike. You could drink it. I mean, the might the conductivity was way down, but I know there had to be a lot of oil grind. Does that contribute to conductivity at all, or not? Uh, or is it? Uh, if it does doesn't, if it doesn't ionize, it's not contributing to conductivity. Okay, so oil uh, transmission fluid antifreeze isn't going to affect conductivity, correct? I would guess not. I, I can't think of ever seeing an example. It's always possible that someone comes up with an antifreeze product that might have some ionic components in it um, as part of the, but ethylene glycol, no, it doesn't. It, as far as I know, it doesn't separate. Okay, thanks. I had a quick question for, for Darren, actually. I was just wondering, um, you have a cell signal for your camera. Um, are, that means you're getting a live stream and are you, are, you, are you pretty happy with that setup? Yes, yes, more than trying to, I've tried and, and I have a limited bandwidth here to, uh, 
try and fail at getting it to uh, record it to the memory card. It has an onboard memory card, but I have had zero success figuring out how to make it do that remotely. So I bring up a uh, program that records my screen and then I just log into it and turn the camera on and I get a real time feed. Uh, Darren, uh, I was going to yes. suggest I have uh, worked up a hack and I think uh, Dave asked if I wanted to put it into a blog, but it's a way of taking a simple $80 trail cam and electrically triggering it, which you can do right from your sensor. In other words, you can set an event, you know, micro Siemens or depth gets above some level, it triggers uh, the trail cam. And then you can set it up from that. And then that's, I've used that and it's worked quite well, but <clears throat> it's a me, it's a way of triggering a trail cam without putting flappers in front of it or whatever. Yeah, or wave, waving something in front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would appreciate it if you'd share that because I do, I, I only have one camera, so I have it facing downstream and I want to flip it around to face it upstream to watch some of the events as they come under that bridge because I think that is probably a more remarkable, remarkable thing to watch as it comes up the sides of the uh, culvert under the bridge. Oh, okay. Well, if there's interest, uh, and Dave, I guess I can talk to you offline about putting in the blog, just the mechanics of hooking up your camera uh, to uh, have an electrical. It's just simply a clo relay closure or a signal from <laughs> the uh, sensor itself that will trigger the <laughs> camera. And Anyway, and I looked online and nobody's figured out how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. You basically put some solder two wires on the board and I have the details of that. So I, I think that would be a useful blog, Jim. Yes. I think you should I think you should proceed with it. Okay. What else? Who anyone else have questions for John or Darren or any topics to discuss related to their subjects? Uh, this is Patty. I have a question um, for John. So if there's no historical data on um, a stream at the headwaters, um, how is it that a person can say or not say what its natural response is to the geology of that area if there's nothing before the, the date that we're in right now? Well, there's a model out there that based on, on large scale geology, you can use to predict what your background conductivity should be. I have not fact checked it and it gets really tricky because of spatial scale, but it's, it's a start. The only other thing you can do is, is, um, is grab a nearby stream that you think represents a reasonable reference, a USGS station or something like that. And for your sites, Patty, almost everything's gonna be better than <laughs> <laughs> for conductivity, as long as it's not limestone. <laughs> um, but that gets to a point, and this is really important, and I left it out, and its context comes up next month if I can get my act together, and that is, this is about te storing, telling stories, and there's a natural history story about conductivity and understanding your geology, and, and there's reasons why we farmed in certain areas and reasons why we didn't. And that had to do with soils and bedrock and, and, and what was available and what produced good crops and what didn't. So um, keep that in mind. Quite often we, went, we, we move right past that onto, onto, we have a pollution problem, but sometimes setting, setting the table with that natural history is how you show how extreme your pollution problem really is. Um, yeah. Patty, I just posted a link to um, the paper that uh, showed the, the one graph with the national uh, distribution of um, conductivity, natural um, conductivity values. Great, thank you. Sure. Mm. Um, all right, we are at 329. <laughs> Here we are again, have blown through an hour. Um, any other questions for uh, John and Darren? 
Um, I will, if folks, if folks are welcome to stay on, I'll, I'll continue with the presentation and just go through some of the other uh, less important things we had. We didn't even get to our um, photos of the month section, but that's sort of a topic of whimsy. Um, so, uh, but I'll just go ahead and proceed with that. So, um, so here's some photos. This is from Plum Run at Gordon Natural Area in Westchester, PA. This is a site that Patty, who was just talking about, who was just uh, talking there, um, has been managing uh, along with Carol Armstrong and George Seeds. And um, this is uh, Carol here doing flow measurements. There's Rachel after successfully installing a station. And here we have a fall time testudine. Mm -hmm. and, and we have another testudine found about the same time uh, at this Darby Creek Headwaters Monitoring Project. Now this is the project, one of the projects Darren is working on. Um, this is one of the hobo loggers that he's been installing. Um, they're going to be also measuring um, chloride using these hot chloride strips, using a simple thermometer, and uh, using a uh, uh, standard kind of uh, you know, handheld conductivity and uh, temperature meter that they can calibrate using the mm -hmm. calibration fluid. Um, and there's the close up of that bad boy. It is. Super, super cool. Oh, well, is a test to die, is that a type of turtle or what? <laughs> <laughs> Glad you asked, Jim. It's the or it's apparently the order. I heard that term recently and I thought I want to use that term. <laughs> it's not a bog turtle and it's not a painted pond. What is it? It's a box turtle. Bog mm. turtle. Okay. It includes all of the sh all the like tortoises, turtles, etc., as a te our testudines. Um, I thought I'd include this. This is one of the streams that is prominent in uh, the uh, kind of the area that some of uh, quite a few of the groups that are in this effort wor are working on. Why Missing Creek is a trib of the uh, of the school kill, and um, it's kind of up there in that region around Angelica Creek and. There's, it's kind of a, got a nice um, kind of concentration of trout streams in that region. I went up there recently and um, in about an hour hooked about a dozen of these little brown trout in there, wild trout, you know, reproducing in there. So that was a, that was a good sign. Um, and then um, this is, uh, is there a question there? No. Uh, and this is here at, at uh, Cheslin Preserve, um, uh, just outside of Westchester. This was just uh, <clears throat> this past weekend when they, there, were, there were these um, alacapnia, the winter stoneflies emerging. Um, there's, the, there's the larva. This is from macroinvertebrates.org. Anyone who's interested in bugs, I encourage you to go to this website. It's really, really nice with high detail photos that you can look at at different angles. You can look at side views, bottom views, etc. cetera. Um, and I, we could go to a video if folks are interested. Um, I think that, oh, and then we've got- um, You have to show that video though. You want, want me to show oh, that video? video? All right, yeah. let, me show, let me show that video. Um, here we go, which was it? It was this one, I believe. That's a shorter. That's a shorter one, Carol. But I think that'll do. Um, so they were everywhere. Lots of those. Lots of those stoneflies. So that was pretty cool. Um, and 
John, anything to say about those winter stoneflies? Muted, guess not. And then Carol, I don't know if you wanna say anything about this crayfish, but Carol was, uh, has been doing some work on this tributary to um, Pickering Creek and found this crayfish and was trying to figure out identification. Yeah, I, I'd love to, if, uh, I have a guess as to what it is, but there are people here who know better, but I also have, happen to have the, uh, some of the water chemistry from the place, exactly the place where this crayfish was, because I'm measuring an, uh, a tributary coming into the main stem pickering in Phoenixville of water from uh, communities, industrial sites, schools, and a trailer park uh, that come into the um, campus of the YMCA, where, and I start measuring here. So I actually have the measurements on the date where I found him. Um, I'll just, nothing too unusual, I'll just mention that the pH was 7.8 and the hardness was 250. Um, the chloride wasn't particularly high, conductivity was around 400. Uh, which is higher than what's in the main stem at that point. So there's definitely human impact, but he's able to survive. I mean, what, what I read about pH is <clears throat> it's in the range uh, 7.5 to 8.5 is what they prefer. So it's in the range of, of his tolerance. But um, anyone have any hypotheses about or guesses about what this what type of crayfish? It doesn't have the spots on the carapace of the rusty, so it doesn't look like a rusty. It was fairly large. His carapace was about three inches. Yeah, Carol, that's probably yeah. the Oronectes virilis, however you pronounce that. Say it again. Uh, the vir virile crayfish, it's the invasive that is in the Pickering Creek that's under study. Maybe, they're but pretty, I mean, they're I... pretty big and they'll get, yeah. you can really see them because there's, yeah. they're not afraid of anything. I mean, I've seen the viral, it could be, I've seen the viral crayfish. It was much bigger than this. Now, I don't know what range they get. It was probably, it, this like wasn't- Four inches? Big. Well, this is three. Yeah, well, they get the, pretty the big. The viral I've seen, well, I can't show you. <laughs> I can show you on my screen. The viral I've seen was at least this big. And this guy was about half that. Oh. Now there may be a range in the size of viral crayfish. I don't know. There's some right. monster crayfish that- um, But this wasn't a monster size. It, 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 yeah, it's no, just- I mean, there's a crayfish that's like six or seven inch long in there. I can't remember the name right now, but that's mm -hmm. a, a, that's not the virile though, I don't think. Yeah, there's I don't, don't think size crayfish in there. Do you know, um, <laughs> Mike, do you know something called the big water crayfish? Uh, nope. Anyone know not, that one? I was nope. hoping John might know too, but John's not here now? <laughs> I'm not sure if John is still on or not. He may have left. Just when we needed him. <laughs> yeah, I think he said that he had a thing at right at uh, at three thirty. I think he may have had to leave. But Carol, yeah, I, I will say this: the people studying the crayfish in the Pickering have found it's another species that is actually it's over six inches long. In, that's and amazing. That's a, a native. And uh, yeah, this guy is, is three inches approximately yeah, from here to here. Oh, yeah, you can't see. Not, sorry, I'm not sharing the screen, but anyway. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Carol. Good info, Mike. Um, okay, so that's, that's what we've got for, um, for our photos today. Um, that's what we've got for our presentations today. I'll just conclude here, um, unless anyone has any pressing questions or needs to address at this point. Um, just wanna emphasize again, we're the third Thursday of every month. So the next one's gonna be December 17th. Um, Zoom link will remain the so same. Please, please, please feel free, you know, all you station owners and managers, pe please feel free to, you know, invite whoever you're working with, volunteers, other staff, um, folks that might that might want to get involved, feel free to invite them to, to these meetings. Um, so 
Here's our uh, uh, schedule for the next couple of months. We've got Francis Collins, who is on the call today from the Primrose Creek Watershed Association. Francis has a really interesting situation out there. Um, <clears throat> Primrose flows directly into the Delaware River north of Philadelphia. And he's a really um, interesting but somewhat unfortunate scenario with a quarry that has drawn water out and has created sinkholes and all kinds of wacky problems that Francis and his crew have been monitoring for quite a while now. Um, and then in January, we've got Juniper and Christine who are gonna talk about um, some of the uh, <clears throat> broader scale type watershed characterization type stuff that we're, we're trying to do with, um, with the data. Uh, and then in February, hopefully we'll have Paul Wilson We'll talk about some of the stuff that he's been doing this semester with his students using Monitor My Watershed and Model My Watershed. And then, as I mentioned, John's going to be um, continuing. Oh, whoops, I got that wrong. Uh, part two will be in December. And then I guess we'll have, uh, I'm not sure who's going to be gone in January. And then Pat, Patty is going to be gone and talking about her master's work um, in the Westchester area in February. And everyone, please feel free to be in touch if you'd like to do one of these presentations. I'm not sure if we have a focus topic for, for January yet. I have to check my records. But if anyone's interested in doing something like that, please be in touch. OK, uh, mentors are available. So be in touch with any of these folks, me or any of these folks, if you need assistance out there in the field or just dealing with any questions or issues you might have. Um, um, dealing with your stations. And then just well, as a Dave, uh, any chance we could set up a special Zoom to go over the G2 to G4 transition? Is that something just you guys are going to take care of or? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that as far as the, the standard stations are concerned, Jim, um, uh, let me let me get out of stop share for a second. As as far to the as far as the standard stations are concerned, that Stroud is building, Shannon and Rachel are basically just in the process of going out and trying to upgrade those across the basin. So, if you're feeling urgent about it, um, or you're just noticing that your station is really dropping off, just be in, be you know feel free to be in touch to push us a little bit on that. But the goal is to pretty much just replace 4G uh, ASAP. They're supposed to phase out 2G, but Shannon was saying today that they really may not actually do that officially and technically right at the end of 2020. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was my concern that suddenly December 31, none of my uh, low cost stations will work anymore. Shannon, so. are, Shannon, are you still on? Do you want to address that or was what I said pretty much take care of it? Yeah, Jim, the uh, the stations that Stroud is in charge of are the ones that we always do the maintenance on. We are keeping an eye on their signals, and some of them have lost them as towers have gone down over the the, the area that we have stations deployed in. But for the most part, um, most of the time lately when a station is dropped offline on 2G, it's because the 2G boards actually only have about a year or two of lifespan in them. We've had a lot of uh, malfunctions with them after a couple of years, so we've had actually um, most of the times when people's 2G stations have dropped offline, it's a malfunction of the board. And rather than give them an, an, uh, a, a new 2G board that will be obsolete soon, we just go ahead and upgrade people. So as uh, boards fail, we upgrade to 4G. And then as Dave said, if, uh, if we see that 4G has all of a sudden died everywhere, we'll rush out and, and uh, upgrade everybody like we did a couple of years ago when AT&T dropped off and we had to replace SIM cards on the uh, on uh, stations to switch them from AT&T to T-Mobile, who is the provider for 2G right now. But um, yeah, the only stations that we will not go out and be doing in person are the ones that people have built themselves, like the ones that you've done there. So um, the, all the instructions are, are there. All you need to do is buy those three or four items that we've got in the list and then modify the code in your sketch to uh, to talk to the 4G board instead of the 2G board. And all of the instructions are in the uh, the are the uh, the GitHub uh, code repository mm -hmm. that we have of how to use our 4G example of uh, of using that code. So it, it's not really that difficult. It could all be completed in one day for multiple stations. So it's it's not too big of a deal. Okay. Well, uh, you're going to send me the link, uh, Dave, and uh, I'll go from there. So um, I thank thanks, uh, Shannon. Yep. 
I just sent it to you, Jim. What was that, David? I just sent it to you. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. And, and I anyone owe Darren else? my uh, my cam hack. So I owe Darren my cam hack. I will send him that. Good. Yeah, and we'll look forward. Scott and Heather and I will look forward to receiving your your camera hack blog. Okay. Well, that uh, that won't happen today. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Um, all right, so uh, I think, let me just share here again, just to be sure, but I think we are pretty much at the end. Um, just as a reminder, please just make use of this um, resource here. There's a lot of different resources. Uh, these are all accordions now, so you can go in here and access whatever you like, but um, and actually, this is a previous image. There's a specific tab in there that now that identifies this particular meeting with all the recordings. Um, the online group, feel free to pose questions there. And then we are at the end. So feel free to be in touch with all of us um, as needed. And um, I think we'll we can you. call well, it quits. But what's that, Jim? Bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Be safe out there. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Um. So what did you guys think? And you might want to end your recording there, Dim. Oh, th thank you, Shannon. Excellent. <laughs> well done. Appreciate that. Ending recording.